Okay, so uh, we are talking, of course, about uh, colonoscopy, and I guess most of you were in the WEO colon cancer screening meeting where we already talked uh, about um, uh, why uh, we miss uh, a cancer, and this is now about endoscopy and um, uh, miss the cancer. So there are three uh, learning points, uh, because I'm talking about the negative colonoscopy, then uh, Helmut will tell you how to improve. Uh, and so what are the main causes of interval cancer? Uh, why uh, and if uh, we miss uh, at colonoscopy, and what is the natural history of missed uh, lesion. So just have a look uh, at the interval cancer. You know that uh, if we exclude uh, the incomplete removal of polyp, there are two causes uh, that uh, overlap each other. One is the novo cancer, uh, and the other is the missed uh, cancer that it was uh, interest uh, um, us. The missed cancer may happen for uh, several reasons. There is a limitation of endoscopy technology that company want to cover. There is the inadequate cleansing that you know very much. There is the incomplete uh, colonoscopy. And this probably is responsible of over 50% of interval cancer. Is this too much? Is this too little? It's always good to have a reference. And the reference is mammography. Mammography that seems such difficult examination actually has only a 20% rate of interval cancer due to missed lesion. So colonoscopy is a very difficult, tough, operator-dependent procedure where um, virtually most of interval cancer are actually due to missed uh, lesion. And unfortunately, as all of you know, this happened in the proximal colon rather than in the, this uh, colon, for, both for incidence and for uh, mortality. And this is the German confirmation of this uh, concept. Uh, as uh, Helmut anticipated, uh, technology is uh, quickly uh, developing. And, and also the endoscopists uh, are improving. For this reason, uh, we may be happy, Helmut, that we are anyway squeezing uh, the risk uh, of interval cancer. And this is due to all the technique uh, you will address uh, in your uh, talk. And uh, it is also good to say that if you are uh, in a screening program or you have done anyway a colonoscopy, you are probably a healthier person uh, and uh, the interval cancer has a reduced morbidity and uh, uh, mortality. So it's always good uh, to have a colonoscopy. The interval cancer is not a harm of colonoscopy, it's only a lack of efficacy. We should never be wrong on this. But now we come to colonoscopy. Do we miss, uh, miss lesion? As you remember until uh, a few months ago, there was one quite old meta-analysis by Evelyn that was actually the most uh, cited article by the Dutch group. But again, the Chinese were a bit uh, competitive on this, and they are not only good in doing endoscopy, but also in doing meta-analysis. And um, this meta-analysis has been just published on um, gastroenterology reporting all the new studies. Are we missing a uh, polyp? Yes. The adenoma miss rate is 26%. So we miss one every four polyp. Are we missing advanced adenoma? Unfortunately, yes. One every 10. Are we missing serrated or society serrated? We are virtually missing one every three. It's more, it's some, you are lucky if you find one, but probably you are missing one every three. What about um, uh, morphology? Of course, we are missing more uh, uh, non-pedunculated than pedunculated, but we are both missing uh, sessile and flat. So it's not only a problem of flat, but also of uh, uh, sessile lesion. So why are we uh, missing? There is no doubt that despite the angle of view is improving, we don't cover all the uh, surface. And then there is uh, the variability across the uh, endoscopy. There is variability in whether we are good in uh, getting to the cecum. Of course, most of those who are here are interested in colonoscopy and can have a, a high intubation rate of uh, 95%. But sometimes there is also the opposite. This is a 
person from uh, my center, he had a colonoscopy two years ago after the fit positive, and probably the endoscopy didn't have time to, to do retroflexion. So uh, this uh, lady had uh, rectal bleeding, she came, I discovered immediately, you, Helmut, you can uh, appreciate the, the very high definition of the sonoscope HD 550. This is the VST, you have seen the VST number one. This is the VST uh, number two for um, a characterization. This was a cancer and uh, it has been sent to uh, radiotherapy and uh, surgery. So colonoscopy must be completed both of the cecum and also in um, retroflexion. But uh, as we heard a lot uh, in this meeting, uh, there is an issue about the performance uh, of the endoscopy. Can we identify some predictor of a poor performance by an endoscopy? Of course, yes. The first is the withdrawal time. This is a, a very unethical uh, randomized trial uh, where people had the first colonoscopy of three minutes, uh, and actually the miss rate with the three-minute withdrawal time was nearly 50%. So if you withdraw quickly, and uh, there are a lot of endoscopies who do it, uh, one every two polyp are missed, so you can have the best endoscopy uh, tower, but you also need to be patient and to have a good uh, withdrawal. Of course, you need a good uh, bowel prep, because if the bowel prep is uh, bad, uh, virtually one every two lesion is missed, according to this gastro paper. But of course, we need to be more careful uh, in the proximal colon, and we are looking forward to what Helmut uh, is going to teach us uh, because the proximal colon has a lot of uh, issues about the position of the scope, about the light, about the fact that it is large, there are the poles, etc. This is the threat lesion that uh, you can uh, identify when you use a high definition scope. On the left, you see this artificial light that is named as uh, VST1 that really extremize the contrast in between the lesion and this random mucosa. Basically, one is whitish, just look at this. One is whitish and the other is reddish and uh, the second characterized. And this really simplifies the detection. I really like to do all my colonoscopy in uh, VST1. Last three slides, and then I give uh, the microphone uh, to Helmut. It is about the, the fact that all of us feel that flat lesions are more dangerous than non-flat uh, lesions. How much is this true? How much is this provocative, uh, etc.? So these are the, uh, within a study prevalence of high-grade um, dysplasia, you may see on the left uh, the polypoid lesion, you may see in the center uh, the flat uh, 2A, and you may see uh, on the right the depressed. Actually, it's funny, Helmut, that if you have a flat 2A lesion, the risk of a high-grade dysplasia is not so increased. What is really uh, dangerous, what is catastrophic, uh, is to miss a depressed neoplasia. But fortunately for you, Helmut is a big expert uh, in um, uh, this. And again, uh, if we uh, look uh, at um, uh, invasive disease, and so submucosal uh, invasion in superficial colorectal neoplasia, again, uh, in a polypoid and a flat 2A, the risk is minimal but in depressed uh, is, um, is a disaster. And this um, is uh, a, a different concept, that it is true that depressed lesions are catastrophic, uh, but even when you look with uh, chrome endoscopy, they are um, actually rare. So you need to uh, scope 250 subjects uh, to find or to miss uh, one um, a depressed uh, a lesion. So if you do 3,000 colonoscopy per year, it uh, will be 10 per year, one uh, per month. So, Helmut, my take-home message uh, is that uh, missed lesion is a, a critical uh, factor because it uh, represents the main cause of interval cancer. The misrated colonoscopy by the most updated uh, meta-analysis on gastroenterology is still a shaming because we miss one every four polyp uh, and uh, one every three serrated uh, lesion, uh, what we must learn uh, is not to miss the, uh, um, a depressed lesion. Thanks. So the topic of this symposium today, ladies and gentlemen, is our future is endoscopy. And we are all here in Prague because we are endoscopists. Are we? we are from different countries in the world, yeah, but we are all sharing one passion, and this is endoscopy. And we are all treating patients in our routine life. Yeah, every day, so many patients, but we're all aware we have to improve. Because we are good, 
but what we have learned before from you, we can become better. And therefore, the question is, what can we do in the future to become better? Why is our future endoscopy? And it's now my pleasure to give this talk about advanced endoscopic imaging for improved anoma detection. Once again, thank you so much for Sonoscape of this invitation and for setting up this lunch symposium here at the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. So some small disclosures for myself, of course, Sonoscape is included as well. But ladies and gentlemen, what is colonoscopy? And of course, we know colonoscopy is a gold standard for detection of colorectal adenomas and cancers. But we also, and this is also what we have learned in your beautiful talk before, that there is a high miss rate when we're doing colonoscopy. At least 30% of adenomas are missed by using standard endoscopic systems. And in this context, I think it's extremely important for us to recognize, again, this very important publication in the New England Journal of Medicine published in 2013 about the long-term colorectal cancer incidence and mortality after low endoscopy. And this is a very fascinating study because this study had not only included up to 89,000 patients, but also there was a follow-up of greater than 22 years. And this study indeed has shown that complete colonoscopy is reducing the incidence of colorectal cancer so we are effective in what we are doing since more than 20 years now. But what is so important to learn from this study, that this is only the case for the distal colon. So we are not that effective in the right colon. So only a total inconspicuous colonoscopy is able to reduce the incidence of right-sided colorectal cancer. But as long as we're detecting one polyp in the colon, doesn't matter if it's in the rectum, in the sigmoid, descending transverse, or ascending colon, there is no influence anymore of screening colonoscopy in the uh, reducing right side colorectal cancer. And in this context, of course, the question is, why is that the case? What is the reason for the reduced effectiveness of colonoscopy, especially in the right colon? And in this context, I think it's very worth to look at the dysplastic lesions in the luminal gastrointestinal tract. And as you can see in the distal colon, most of the lesions showing an advanced histology, well, they are lesions what we can detect. So most of them, they are polypoid lesions or lesions greater than five millimeter in size. But if you see this comparison to the right colon, to the proximal colon, you can see that more than two-thirds of the lesions located in the right colon, well, they are diminutive, less than five millimeter in size, or they are non-polypoid lesions, so what we formally call is flat. And this might be one idea why we are missing the lesions, especially in the right colon, and what we have previously learned from you, why colonoscopy can still be improved. So what can we do? What can we do in order to become better? And of course, we can apply more contrast. And in this context, we all know about optical chromoendoscopy techniques. So optical chromoendoscopy was introduced to our field more than 10 years ago. And we know we have different endoscopy systems like NBI or optical enhancement, but the principle is always the same. So we have an optical filter, which is narrowing the red light out of the visible light spectrum. And this consists of three different colors, red, green and blue. So we just have at the end blue and green left and with blue and green we are highlighting the superficial capillaries and the subepithelial veins. Is it now effective to use optical chromoendoscopy for detection of colorectal lesions? And this was a recent study published in the Red Journal in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. 360 patients were randomized and you can see the polyp detection rate as well as the adenoma detection rate was significantly increased by using optical chromoendoscopy, and even the mean number of polyps per patient was uh, higher in the optical chromoendoscopy group compared to standard high-definition white light endoscopy. So for detection, there seems to be an argument to use optical chromoendoscopy, and in this study, again, it was a randomized controlled trial. It was superior to high-definition white light for the detection. So what about characterization, especially when we're focusing on the lower GI tract? And again, you can see that indeed differentiation of neoplasia and non-neoplasia and cancer, adenoma or non-adenoma, this can be done by using optical chromoendoscopy. This technique definitely is reliable to distinguish between all the different areas in the lower luminal gastrointestinal tract. So now the question is, we all know about NBI since many years now. 
but we are not here to talk about NBI. But we are here to talk about something what is totally new, and this is now this new optical chromoendoscopy system from Sonoscape. So again, Sonoscape is a new company. The first introduction to the European market was, by the way, at the ESGE days, the first ESGE days in Budapest. Cesare, we have been there. It's uh, much more less people than today. Thank you so much again for being here because this is really totally brand new. And I think we're all very keen to learn about this new company and the new technique. And we have a new optical chromoendoscopy system as well integrated in this machine, and this is called VIST for Variable Intelligence Staining Technology. So the technology is a technology combining both optical and digital image processing. We have a very clear and bright images with a very high and bright contrast, and this also results in a better visualization of both the surface vascular pattern and mucosal vascular pattern morphology. The principle of this VIS technology is an optical chromoendoscopy system, but not only optical chromoendoscopy, but in addition digital post-processing. But what we are doing with optical chromoendoscopy, again, we are narrowing the red light out of the visible light spectrum from red, green, and blue. So we are taking a little bit of red out, and this yields in a better visualization, again, of the mucosal surface and vascular pattern morphology. So I think we are all clinicians, and we are all endoscopists, and it's very exciting to study all those uh, technical details, but I think it's more important to look at the videos and to look at the, vid uh, and the images. And Cesare, you have already highlighted a um, very beautiful case here. You can see this is a new machine, and we have different modes, which is called VIST-1 and VIST-2, better highlighting the surface or the vascular pattern morphology. And you can also see here in this moving image, we have really a very nice illumination here. And again, this is, I think, very exciting for us to recognize a totally new company for us on the market. So if you look at high definition white light, you can see that's really an excellent quality. But again, I think it's very exciting for us to study this VIST mode type one. And this is something what is highlighting the red color in the tissue. And specifically, when you look at these residual formations here of the stool and fluid, they still remain in the natural colors. So this is very exciting for us to recognize because this is a mode what might be used in the future to increase detection rates. The second mode is called VIS2, and this is a mode which is highlighting the vascular pattern morphology when it can be used for image characterization. So if we're going, for example, to this type 2A lesion, yeah, Paris type 2A, slightly elevated lesion in the luminal gastrointestinal tract. You can see this image, and then image with VIST. This is for the demarcation of the borders. It's much more clearly visible here, and you can see it's an increasing uh, image of the red color, but if you look at this residual formation, this still remains in the same color, and this is very important, and then we have this traditional chromoendoscopy mode, totally similar to NBI, for example, which can be used for optical chromoendoscopy, and I think those images are really very fascinating, and you can see this new machine here at the ESGE days as well at the booth of the company, and I think you are highly invited to have a look at this and even to feel the scope and uh, then to provide us with some feedback about this new technology. The question is always when we're talking about new technologies, is it now comparable to existing ones or not? Because of course, we need to treat our patients and we are learning about miss rates. Can we now use a new technology or not? Is it now worth to use or is it only one of the new technologies? And Cesaro, when we started using this technique, we had the same question and we are not only questioning, but we are also trying to find a solution. And this was the idea of a new randomized uh, controlled trial. Of course, when we are doing studies uh, with Professor Hassan, then we are doing also, of course, the best study design which is possible, and this was a non-inferiority trial, including centers from China, Thailand, Italy, Russia, and Germany, and the aim was to compare optical chromoendoscopy techniques. So we compared Sonoscape to the existing ones from Olympus and Pentax, and you can see the performance parameters assessed were the sequel intubation time, the withdrawal time, the total examination time, the number of polyps detected, and even the average size of the polyps. 
250 patients were included in this non-inferiority trial, and you can see no difference were uh, observed regarding the gender, age, the previous surgery, or even the bowel preparation. But what is now very important for us, of course, to look at the data. And the data are the following. You can see with Olympus, we had a mean sequel intubation time of 10 minutes, withdrawal time 9. So it was a fitting, yeah, the recommendation of the withdrawal time, so not too long and not too fast. Polyps detected were uh, detected in 43% of um, patients, average size 5 millimeter. This is all within the range, and 43%, of course, is a very good detection rate. With Pentax, uh, slower sequel intubation time, withdrawal time, very similar. Detection rate a little bit uh, lower, and the average size of polyps detected was 6 millimeter. And now, of course, we're all very keen to learn about the very new brand, which is totally... Mm -hmm. Yeah, different for some aspects, but please look at the booth, at the machine. And this is now the result for Sonoscape. Again, it was a non-inferiority trial. You can see sequel intubation time, 8 minutes, withdrawal time, 10, detection rate in between, and even the average size was the same. And I think this is very important for us. That this is what we have learned from the study as well. So the new brand is not inferior to the one what we are already using here in Europe since more than 20 years now, and this was the aim of this first study, and I'm pretty sure some other studies will follow very soon. So, dear gentlemen, uh, I think in conclusion we have learned that colonoscopy indeed is effective, but we are missing lesions. So we are good, but we have to become better. And we also have learned about new endoscopic technologies. So by using advanced endoscopic imaging modalities in this setting, for example, optical chromoendoscopy, indeed we can better detect and characterize lesions throughout the whole luminal gastrointestinal tract. So we are good, but we can become better by using advanced imaging. And also, of course, we can use advanced endoscopic imaging techniques for in vivo characterization of the tissue. We all know about this. And we have a lot of meetings here at the ESGE days focusing on this specific topic as well. But advanced imaging, there is really a roll off. And I think in this setting, it's really very exciting for us that we're able to welcome a new endoscopy brand to us in Europe, Sonoscape. And we have seen in the first study that indeed this system is not inferior to those other brands which has been studied. In this study, it was Olympus and Pentax. So this system, I think, is very exciting for us to, to look at. And therefore, again, there is a very nice booth here. I've already seen it this morning. And maybe you can have a look afterwards or during the upcoming days to see the system because, again, we are all endoscopists. It's not only about studies. It's not only about pictures. But, of course, we need to handle the scope as well. And therefore, I think it's very important that you're also feeling the instrument by yourself and give us some feedback. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helmut. Right now. Thank you.